Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In our Gospel reading today, Jesus, or Luke records a moment of Jesus' ministry, where Jesus, the Holy One of God, with power and authority, makes an unholy man holy. I want you to imagine a, a scene with me. It's something that I've seen a few times come across my various news feeds over the last few years. There's a man in prison, and he's been in prison for the better part of a decade. And prison has hardened his heart against the world. Instead of a smile upon his lips, he wears a snarl. And his eyes are an intense heat burning against the world. And he just hates the world because of what they did to him, abandoning him in this prison. Most people know that if you're walking up to this man, you don't say hi to him or hello to him or anything like that because he'll just grunt to you in response. Well, one day he's told that his lawyer has come to visit with him. And he's not quite sure why, but he's led into this room where his lawyer is sitting across the table, and that snarl is still worn upon his lips, and that intense heat is burning from his eyes against his world, and now against his lawyer. And probably burning a little more intensely against his lawyer, because here's the man who abandoned him to his moment of need when everyone else had abandoned him too. And so the lawyer... Uh, as this man is staring across from him with his perfectly combed, shiny hair, his more his fine, expensive-looking suit, and probably snake smile across his face, he <clears throat> says to the man, knowing that small talk's not going to do any good, I just want to let you know that I'm here with some good news. We're going to reopen your case. Some new DNA evidence has been found. And the man, uh, with that intense snarl and intense heat burning in his eyes, just stares at his lawyer and says, what good is that going to do? The same people who are going to look at that evidence now are the same ones I entrusted to prove my innocence before, and they failed me then, and I know they'll fail me again. Well, about three weeks goes by, and the man finds himself in the courtroom. And he's sitting at the table next to his lawyer, but he's not, uh, he's not looking around the courtroom, and that snarl is still worn upon his lips, probably a little, more, a little more visible and a little more intense. And his eyes that are burning in intense heat against the world are now, we would say, trying to burn a hole through that table. He's just staring at it. He doesn't want to be there. He's not looking around at anyone else to see what they're doing. And while he's sitting there staring at that table, he hears his lawyer stand up and begin his opening remarks. And he hears the lawyer talking, and he hears the other lawyer stand up and offer objections. He hears the judge offer sustainings and overrulings. And then his lawyer offers the evidence, the new DNA evidence that's been found. They give it to the judge. And the judge receives that evidence and he examines it closely. He notices that it's been processed in the right manner. It was collected in a good way. And that it's been tested against this man's DNA. And it's been found not to be a match. And so from his authority as a judge and his bench high above the courtroom, he is able to pronounce that this man who's been in prison for 10 years is now... And not guilty of his crime. And the man who's sitting there hardened against the world, the snarl on his lips and the intense heat burning in his eyes looks up at the judge. And it, to him it seems like an hour has gone by while he's trying to process this news. But really it's instantaneous. The snarl falls from his lips as his jaw falls to the floor. The intense heat burning in his eyes is extinguished by a well of tears now streaming down his face. And as he weeps, his head falls into his hands and he just cries. He is a changed man. His 
his heart that was so hard against the world is softened. Because that judge who stood in that courtroom with his power and authority in his word declared this man who was unholy to be holy. We are unholy. We are unholy in our sin. And our sins often, in an unholy way, hold us captive, much like that demon holding that man captive in Luke's gospel this morning. And one of the worst sins that holding us captive is a sin like anger. Anger that just gets into your heart and it holds you captive in anger against the world, against your friends, against your family, against your loved ones. And here's what Jesus says about anger in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says that those who are angry even against their own brother are liable to judgment. For it's in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus compares anger to committing murder in your heart. But anger is such a common emotion for us and we are so guilty of bearing that sin. And when we're angry it holds us captive. Imagine driving down the road. You're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off, right? And that makes you angry. They've cut you off and you, your first thought is to say, how can they be so stupid? How can they be so stupid to cut me off? Don't they know that they could have killed me? They could have killed themselves. They could have wrecked my car. How can they be so stupid? And you think about that stupidity, and it burns in your heart, and it hardens your heart against them. And as you're driving down the road, it just lingers and lingers until you get to your destination. And you walk into that grocery store or that coffee shop, and your anger is just there holding on to you, keeping you captive as you're shopping, and then you get up to the cash register, and that cashier makes one simple mistake that anyone could make, and all you can think of is, how stupid can they be? How can they do that and make that mistake to you, keeping you here an extra 15 minutes, and so you and your anger, you lash out at them, and you let them have it, you tell them how stupid they are and what they've done. And then when you leave the store and you get in your car and you think about that moment, you think, well, how can they have made me lash out that way? How dare she make me make that big public outburst? I can't believe she made me yell at her like that. How stupid could this lady be? And that anger just keeps burning all the way home. And then you get home and you get a phone call from a loved one, maybe a family member, a brother or a sister or a friend. And you go to tell them about your day, how stupid everybody's been, making mistakes left and right, and how that anger has just been held in your heart. And as you're talking to them about it, that person on the phone, they don't seem to care. They don't understand. They don't want to listen. And that makes it even worse to the point where that anger burns so brightly in your heart that you say something that you can never take back. And you hurt someone that you never intended to hurt. In that anger. Anger has a way of holding us captive and just building up within us and leaving us unfolded. In Luke's gospel today, Luke records a moment in Jesus' ministry where Jesus, the Holy One of God, by the authority of His Word, declares an unholy man to be holy. Last week we read uh, the text right before this, and it says in our text today, and then Jesus got up and went to Capernaum. So it's, they're right in context with one another. Last week we, were, we heard where Jesus comes with power uh, to proclaim his good news to the world. And he did that in his own hometown, Nazareth. And he did that in a synagogue where his brothers were probably there. His friends were there. His neighbors were there. And they did not like what he, they had, he had to say, and they became angry at him. Angry in such a way that their anger developed, and it took hold of them, and it held them captive to the point where they were ready to take Jesus, drive him out to the edge of the city where they were going to throw him off a cliff to his death in hatred of Jesus. They were going to commit real murder in their anger. But Jesus made himself invisible in their midst, and he walks away. 
And now leaving that anger, Jesus then goes to Capernaum in Galilee, where he starts preaching once again with authority. And the people in Galilee, they respond with joy. They've never heard such authority before. They've never heard anyone preach that they are sinners. They've never heard anyone preach that they will be forgiven by the Holy One of God who is coming. They've never heard anyone preaching with such authority before in their life. And they are amazed. And so they gather around him every Sabbath day, every moment they can, to hear him preach. And then on this Sabbath day, a man walks in, possessed by the unclean spirit of a demon. And we read that sentence, unclean spirit of a demon, and we think, well, Luke, that's a very long way to say he was possessed, right? Uh, we know what that means, that that demon is clearly unholy, clearly unclean. But what Luke is doing here is he is making an acknowledgement to both the Jews and the Gentiles that in the Jewish traditions and in the Jewish faith, uncleanliness was unholiness. So we say, you know, uncleanliness is next, or cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, that's the way they would say it too. Cleanliness is holiness. You have to be clean, and a spirit coming into you makes you unclean. That makes you unholy. So here, this unholy man comes into God, Jesus' presence, into this community, into this synagogue, and he is held captive by that demon. We don't hear a word from this man before or after the, the exorcism. But the demon holding him captive is the one who speaks. As the demon comes in, the demon says, Ha ha! Jesus of Nazareth, what do you want to do with us? You want to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And with that, Jesus says to that demon, with power and authority, be silent and come out of him. And so that demon, in one last act of captivity over this man, throws the man to the ground in an effort to hurt him and comes out. But Jesus, by the authority of his word, keeps this man from harm. And the man is saved. For Jesus came into this world, in this moment, with his power and authority as the Holy One of God, to declare this unholy man holy. And that is what Jesus has done for us. We are who, have, who are held captive by our anger, held captive by our sins, have been declared by the authority and power of Jesus to be holy, even though we are unholy. You see, Jesus, the Holy One of God, came into this world, into our flesh, and took on our sins and was crucified for us so that he would become our holy sacrifice. That his holy and precious innocent blood would wash over us, forgiving us of our sins and giving us the gift of eternal life in him. Jesus died for our sins so he could take us who are unholy and make us holy. And he rose from the dead so that we would have a holy eternal life with him in heaven. And Jesus sits at the right hand of God, the seat of power and authority, where he continues to proclaim his authoritative word into our lives so that he can find us in those moments when we have become unholy in anger, just driving down the road, and he can proclaim us once again to be holy, as he has done among us today. For today in the word of God, it has been proclaimed on you who were unholy in your sins that you are holy because Jesus has died for you. Jesus has come into this world in this moment with his power and authority as the Holy One of God to declare the unholy holy. And so the application of this text isn't quite clear as you're reading through. The easy application would be to see what happens next to the man. But this, after the man is exercised and thrown to the floor without harm, we don't see him again. He's gone. But what Luke does is he brings us back to the congregation. He brings us back to the people who have witnessed the authority of Jesus and who are marveling once again at the authority of Jesus. You know what they do? 
They go out and they get their loved ones who are sick, their loved ones who are dying, their loved ones who are demon-possessed, and they bring them to Jesus so that Jesus could preach his power and authority over them and make the unholy once again holy. What these people do is they seek out Jesus and his holiness. And that's what we are called to do. And when we find ourselves held captive by anger, driving down that road, that person cuts you off, and you just want to scream at them to give that in prayer to God. To ask Jesus, the Holy One of God, with His power and authority to release you from your captivity to anger. That you could be at peace. No longer unholy, but holy. That as you find yourself angry with a loved one, saying something that you know that you can't take back, that you would go to God in His powerful, authoritative word, for He will declare to you that you are no longer unholy, but holy, and give you an opportunity for restoration. And to do that, I recommend you start with the Psalms. Just open up your Bible to the Psalms, about the middle of the Bible. In many of those psalms, King David is wrestling with anger. Anger against God, anger against people in his life, anger with himself. And where he almost always leaves it is with God and his authority. That God is greater than that anger. And that God makes the unholy holy. Or you could start with the Gospels. Where we encounter uh, moments like this in Jesus' ministry. When Jesus comes with his power and authority, the Holy One of God, who makes the unholy holy once again. Seek God out in his power and authority, because Jesus has come to make you and I, who are unholy, holy. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and